Thank you. 
Carr, your host here on the Black Star Network. Every Friday, we spend an hour exploring ideas and subjects of special importance to Black people and others fighting to build a better society. Now, if you've been following us, uh, then you know that in the tradition of folks like Gil Noble, Lister Bell Middleton, and others, we gather elders who have had an incredible impact on our people and on society, thinkers, folks still working and who are continuing to contribute. And we put them in conversation, in an intergenerational conversation with our HBCU master teachers, with our legal round table, with authors and others. And over the arc of uh, our program so far, we've had folks like Adolph Reed and Abdullah Kalimat and Andrew mm -hmm. and Amy Billingsley and uh, Robert Smith. Well, today we want to continue that and to enhance it. The name of this program is The Black Table. Well, we thought we might spend some time with someone who can help us understand what we mean when we say black. For many people viewing today, this will be your first listening session with a legit, as the young people would say, an actual black philosopher. Now he's gonna probably quickly tell us that black folk been doing philosophy for a long time, but this is a man with a PhD in it at a time when there were very few and there's still not enough. So uh, joining us today at the black table, one of the great minds of our time, the great Lucius Turner, outlaw, senior. I'm sorry. Yeah, senior, right? right. Nope. Father, no way. No, it's, no, no, your son is the third. So you junior. I'm junior. That's right. That's right. I always want to say when I when I say the Turner, it messes me up. But but in fact, you contributed your son to the faculty of Howard University. He's up there with, up here with us in the uh, in the pro. That's right. At the law school. That's law right. School. And he's loving it. He's loving Absolutely. it. It's been good for him. Absolutely. And his students love him. His yeah, students good. love him. So for uh, those, oh, go ahead, Prof. I'm sorry. What'd you say? I was just going to say, I told him, if you convince your students that you love them, you can make very high demands on them, and they will do their best to live up to your demands. Absolutely. He's loving it. Absolutely. He's loving it. Between you and your wife, uh, certainly his first teachers. Mm. certainly took that instruction by watching you all because everybody at the Howard University student, School of Law who have been his students, Lucius III, have said that he is indeed a master teacher. So he learned from the best. So I, I expect that would be nothing less. Thank you. Thank you much. And thank you for having me and honoring me by asking me to be at the Black Table. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, brother. It's our honor. Um, for those who uh, are not familiar with Dr. Outlaw, he's uh, the Joseph Johnson Distinguished Le Leadership Professor. Uh, at Vanderbilt University, um, W. Alton Jones, Professor of Philosophy in the Department of Philosophy and also the Department of African American and Diaspora Studies and of Human and Organizational Development at Peabody College. So Vanderbilt and Peabody, of course, uh, part of the same institution. He joined mm -hmm. the faculty about 22 years ago before that. And when many of us met him, he was the T. Wister Brown Professor of Philosophy at Haverford College, right outside of Philadelphia. And those of us from the South, you know, it, it might as well say Philly. It's right in the area. <laughs> and uh, that's right. Uh, it's there is, that's right. You know, it, we don't do them suburbs. Like, well, this is all part of the same town. Uh, <laughs> so, just, just, just an extension of West Philly. No, no question. No question. Uh, Professor Outlaw writes and, and teaches about everything from race and ethnicity to American philosophy, African-American and Africana philosophy, critical social theory, uh, the history of philosophy. Uh, he is the author of two collected works, uh, volumes on race and philosophy from 1996 and critical social theory in the interests of black folk from 2005. But he has a, a number of other publications uh, in, in addition to that. Uh, a son of Mississippi, Starkville, Mississippi. Uh, he is a graduate of Fisk University, Phi Beta Kappa, and also, as I said, Boston uh, College, where he got his PhD in philosophy in 1972. Uh, Prof, I, I mm. want to start with a question. Um, you know, since COVID has started, so many of us have moved online in these spaces. And, and you gave an interview that has been circulated widely with Philip McReynolds, a philosopher. I think he's at UNC, if, if, if not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he... You made you made a you made a comment, and I think I wrote it down. Actually, you said, "Yeah, people of African descent, starting particularly with enslavement and oppression in the Americas, in the United States in particular, were compelled, were compelled to philosophize about the most fundamental issues, like, who am I?" Well, 
who are you from coming out of Mississippi and shaped by black institutions before you ever showed up at Fisk and mm -hmm. you know, craft where very few African people were in the late 1960s and, and, and trying to reconcile that craft with that emerging field of black studies. Do you mind mm -hmm. a little bit about who you are and how you came to be who you are? Well, you know, that's a great question, uh, Greg. And, you know, um, my life was, has been impacted in ways I never anticipated by, by way of my matriculation to Fisk University in 1963. Uh, a bunch of my classmates and I celebrated the 55th anniversary of our graduation uh, a few weeks ago. And we all shared that we had no idea what we were getting into, no idea how our lives would be impacted by going to Fisk. Now, for me, one of the commitments I had made to myself as I was approaching graduation from high school was that I didn't want to go to school in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I wanted out. I simply, you know, I had spent some time at a number of HBCUs in, in Mississippi. You know, I knew about Mayor Holmes Junior College was nearby. I had been to Valley State. I'd been to Jackson State on a number of occasions. A lot of my hometown people went to Jackson, went to Alcorn, went to Valley State. A few, we even went to two little private school down in Jackson. Yes. I didn't want to be in Mississippi. I wanted out of Mississippi. And my original intent was to go to TSU. Now, yes, that was my original. One of my best friends had a brother who had gone to Tennessee State. Huh. And so that's how I knew something about Tennessee State. Now, part of my background is I was a, a young preacher in high school and I went to go study religion philosophy. And there was a young brother from the Starkville area who was studying at American Baptist College Seminary. Yes. We happened to be talking one day and I was telling him what I had hoped to do. And he says, well, you're not going to be able to study religion philosophy at Tennessee State, but you can do it at this other place called Fisk University. I didn't know anything about Fisk. So I wrote and got a catalog and so I reading up on it. And he says, you know, by the way, the other thing about Fisk, they got the most beautiful black women in the world. <laughs> Okay. And you wrote about the fact that you, you were able to confirm what you oh, were two generations yeah. before. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, <laughs> yeah, re, and I tell people, you know, Du Bois, I had the same experience as Du Bois. The first time, my freshman year, when all the upper class women and students came back and I went to the dining hall that first Sunday, yes. I'd never seen anything like it. I couldn't even eat. It was, it was so astounding. <laughs> but Fisk was a place, now remember the you know, the national movement was still on the way when I got to Fisk in 1963. Yes. So this was a major happening in and around campus and around that. Now, my parents told me, don't get involved, don't get involved, don't get involved. They were afraid of what happened to me. They were afraid of what could happen to them if word got back that I was involved in the movement. And they were really afraid of, you know, losing jobs and danger to them. And I stood one day on campus as students were marching off from in the middle of campus, go back out to demonstrate. They were demonstrating on Morrison's over on West End. Yes. And I stood there and cried because I couldn't go. And I made a commitment to myself as well. If I can't be out here in the street, I'm going to find a way to make my contribution to this effort. Yes, sir. And one of the things about Fisk that impressed me was there were all these faculty living on campus. And I'm looking at this saying, this isn't just a job. This is their life. This is how they live. Absolutely. And there were young men around, young men who had PhDs even in their 20s. And I was like, I want to do that too. I want to live like this too. And I made a decision that I want to become a college or university teacher at a place like Fisk. That's remarkable. And that my work as a teacher would be to contribute as best I could to that ongoing struggle. Now, another element of that was my senior year. Every spring, Fisk had an annual arts, fine arts festival. Mm -hmm. And each spring, they would bring to campus a huge gathering of some of the best minds in the black world, hmm. Lerone Bennett, Gwendolyn Brooks, 
Oliver. John Oliver Killens was a writer in residence at the time. Yes. Amira Baraka, uh, Ron Welburn, oh. a young Dardell Lee who became Haki Matabudi. I mean, all of these people were coming to campus for this week long thing, and they would be having symposia and conferences and speeches and whatever. And you were expected to go to as many of those as you possibly can every day, every night, et cetera. It's about and, you all. This is the living archive. There are folks out there. If you want to trace just a glimpse of this, go back to the old Negro Digest, which became the right. black world. You that's will see right. reports from the Fisk conferences. But that just gives you a look. What we're getting now, this is what what uh, what a Hampate Ba in West Africa calls the living tradition. A little bit later yeah. on, Prof, we're going to ask you about genealogy. And so when you want to know the roots of black studies, this is it's a living tradition. Uh, yeah. Prof, Prof, we're about 10 minutes in. Can we take a moment of pause? And when we come back, you pick up exactly where you are because you're about to help us walk across this bridge to how you entered into the field of philosophy. All right. In the interest of black folk. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Prof. So when we return, we are going to continue with Professor Lucius T. Outlaw, Jr., and our discussion of blackness and philosophy here at the Black Table. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Welcome back to the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Greg Carr, and we are joined today with Professor Lucius T. Outlaw, Jr., Vanderbilt University, son of Mississippi. He is walking us through his formative years at Fisk. Prof, when we um when we left, you were about to, uh, you were on the verge of, of helping us think with you as you as a young man entered this conversation with these folk who come from all over the country and the world having mm. these conversations. Was this the year you were student body president? This was the year I was student got president, my senior year. And one of the seminal moments is Amira Baraka gave a talk in the Appleton Room one night. And I sat there and I listened to that talk. It was stunning. When it was over, after the question asked, I waited around until I could go up, shake his hand and thank him. And what I said to Baraka that night was, I may have come to this university as a Negro, but I will leave as a black man. That's how powerful. Now, also that as president of student government, I had been in an intense struggle with a group of students, Nika Giovanni and others who were trying to get a chapter of SNCC on campus and the administration yeah. didn't want it to happen. It was a very intense struggle. That's another long throw. And one night after meeting, Nick and them had been in the student government during the meeting, calling us everything but a child of God. We were lapdogs for the white people downtown. You just a hanker of head, big girl, blah, blah, blah. What? But didn't she know that you, it don't, uh, if I remember correctly, didn't you campaign on representing students? She knew better I, than that. <laughs> I, had been, I had been elected, denounced during the campaign speeches by one candidate. I had been denounced as a radical. <laughs> now here we are, 10 months later, I've been denounced as a handkerchief head on the tongue. And this so I, real life school days. Y'all seen right? spicy school days. Now you oh, see yeah. real time, a generation before the, right? the HBCU, brother. Right. So <laughs> I lead that meeting. We've been in this meeting arguing for two or three hours. I walk out of that meeting. I'm standing in the hallway. I'm exhausted. I'm emotionally wrung out. Nikki walks out of that room, walks up to me. I'm standing in the hallway, leaning against the wall. Nikki walks up to me, kisses me on the cheek and says, Lou, we love you, and walked away. My God. I was so confused. And I got to, <laughs> <laughs> this past October, Nikki was brought back to give the Jubilee Day uh, 
keynote address, and I introduced her, and I began by saying, it was a strange kiss from Nikki that day. And <laughs> people were like, where is this going? What, right. And it took, it took me years to understand that Nikki was saying to me, this isn't personal. Right. This isn't personal. Right. And I was thinking it was personal. It was like, this isn't personal. It's a political struggle, but we love you, and walked away, you know. That, and it took me years for it. But that 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 was part of the orientation. When I went to graduate school mm-hmm. and had to decide on a dissertation, that dissertation of focus opens with that quote from the soldier of black folk yes. about double consciousness. Yes. And the point of my dissertation was to make an argument that with the transformation of consciousness from colored and Negro to black, the divided consciousness was being resolved. Uh, and that was the effort I was trying to make in my dissertation. And that's what you were doing. You know, it's interesting that you, you, you say that, Prof, because um, as I said before we went live, we had a conversation a little over a month ago with uh, another friend of yours, Adolph Reed Jr. Mm. And, uh, and and then you showed us that you, were in fact, have read and are reading the book that we asked him about, The South, and both of yeah, you yeah. sons of the South, this this concept he talked about and that you have talked about for many years and have written about, you know, coming to Fisk, that wasn't your introduction to Black institutions. The young people call it Black excellence. Sometimes some of us say, well, it's excellence in Black. Mm-hmm. You came from that high academic standard. I think I, think I remember you saying you saw the son of one of the trustees get sent home for bad acts. That's right. First semester. That's when you realize, hey, no, but, but but carrying that expansive concept of blackness into your work at Boston, mm-hmm. um, a, a, a blackness so expansive that regardless of politics, realizing that we are black people, as you got, undertook that work and that produced the uh, language and the transformation of consciousness, mm-hmm. your, your dissertation, um, reading through it, looking at its footnotes, you see, you've got Harold Cruz and John Bracey, you got James Turner and so many others, but then you've also got Heidegger, you got Hegel. How are you grappling with this question of blackness and beingness in a field like philosophy where mm-hmm. there were so few people at the time? And what drove you into that field, uh, bro? Well, you know, it's an interesting question because part of it was, so in coming to first major in philosophy and religion, I'm reading, you know, and I tell people, I'm, from my undergraduate years at Fisk all the way through my PhD, I was never in a philosophy class where I had a professor who was a person of African descent, nor a sign of text written by a person of African descent, ever, ever, what? never, never, not in any course I ever took from my undergraduate through my graduate years in philosophy, did I ever read a text written by a black person. So, yeah. so your master teachers, I mean, you mentioned, of course, the great Elsie Collins, who, who only made transition very recently. Uh, and but, he, but his class, see, I had him as a first semester freshman. Oh. And in my senior year, before I graduated from Fisk, I made sure that I took his Negro literature class. So that's where I did it. I read, but it wasn't happening in philosophy. You didn't get any of what you bring to philosophy from philosophy. Nope. You got so it from I, black traditions outside. Of, oh, this is fast. Right. Please, please go that's ahead. Right. Go ahead, Bobby. Please, that's please. right. So while I'm in graduate school, I go to this lecture one night. Big crowd of people there. This man gives this lecture. I'm like, my goodness, what is this? And I come out and there's people selling his books. And I go buy one and I'm blown away by the sheer title of this book. Because the title is The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. Come on. Not Harold Cruz. You, you, you heard Cruz. I heard Cruz went and got that book. And I'm trying to think about how to be an intellectual. This man is talking about the crisis. I'm like, oh, Lord. Exactly. I go read this. Right. Now, I meet Harold Cruz later on, and we have some really interesting conversation. But that was a seminal text. And later, in the December of 1968, I go to over at Harvard Square, browsing through bookstores. I go in this bookstore. And I look over on a rack and I see something that just stops me dead in my track. Hmm. Because it, there's, a, there's a journal in a rack that has a title. I had never seen those two words put together. The Black Scholar. Wow. It was the first issue of the journal. Really? Nathan here. Right. And I'm looking at this going, what the hell? Black and scholar, 
great. So Hal Cruz, Christ of the Negro Intellectual, the Black Scholar, I've been caught up in this whole Black consciousness, Black power thing, having to rethink my way. And so I've got to find, and I've got this commitment, I'm not going to be in the street, I'm going to try to be inside these educational institutions, I want to be a teacher, but I got to arm myself to do this. So my dissertation is fundamentally drawing off of particularly Du Bois and Fanon. The language thing is coming straight out of his chapter, The Negro and Language, in one of his texts. All this other stuff is to help me make this case, et cetera, uh, for how to prepare myself to continue inside the academy working in a discipline where it ain't there ain't nothing about black folk, but I'm seeing what's happening in politics, history, sociology, et cetera, right? Where a whole lot of people are talking about black sociology, black history, black literature, yeah, black music, exactly. black. So then me and a bunch of other people are saying, okay, we gotta do black philosophy then. And of course, the discipline is like, there's no such thing. We're like, yeah, we're going to make it be such a thing. Well, well, let's talk about that a little bit, because, you know, they're in the late 60s and you've written about the death of King, how that impacted you and so many other things going on at the time. As you carry that momentum into the 70s, you turn out a job at Boston. They, they say, we usually don't do internal stuff, but we want you to That's stay. Right. You, 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 you feel compelled to go back to Fisk and That's join right. that faculty. And as I told you before, I mean, for you to draft the dissertation, the one you wrote in a matter of months is to me, I think anybody who's ever written one would have to sit back and say, what the yeah. hell? But, yeah. but you, what, why do you decide not to enjoy or pursue the life of a scholar, which is usually a very singular, solitary life, very insular. Mm -hmm. But as you say, you join with this wave of like-minded, mm -hmm. unfortunately, men with one, I think it was one woman you mentioned, but you all come together and eventually produce this philosophy born of struggle collective. You join mm -hmm. together. Uh, then, then you began cultivating over the years another generation with like the racial theory, root formations. Why was it and why is it so important for you that your intellectual work is driven by teaching and community engagement and work. And what was it like in the 70s and 80s to find like-minded Black folk and move forward as a collective rather than just mm. like these heroic individuals? Well, I mean, again, remember so much of the Black consciousness, Black power moment was in social terms. It wasn't in individualistic terms. And so it was about uh, being part of some social group. You know, there's a lot of talk about revolution. One of the essays in, in uh Hal Cruz's book, Reform and Revolution, and he said in one of them, said, you know, you young folk want to talk about revolution, but if you really understood what it was about, you stop talking about it, because this is serious <laughs> business. Yes, sir. And so I became clear that I was going, I was reading Marxist and left stuff, but I understood I wasn't going to be out in the street with no gun, right? Right. I was committed to education. I was committed to the notion that education could make a difference. And I got called back to Fisk. I didn't even apply for a job at Fisk. I was called and told to apply for this job. I wasn't, I had been interviewing at Mississippi State in my hometown. That's another story. <laughs> I came and did an interview. When I got to go meet with the president of Fisk, President James Lawson, I went to his office, Secretary Paul, and told him I was there. He got up and met me at the door. When I walked into his office, he reached out and shook my hand. And he said to me, Lucius, you're coming back to Fisk. That's settled. I hear you have a wife. You're married. What's your wife's name? That began my conversation with the president. <laughs> now that, that's old school. That's some old school I, HBCU presidents who built faculties like that. That's right. And he says, Ooh, man. And, and during the conversation, he says, now we've got these apartments over here for faculty. I want you and your wife to live in these apartments over here. He wanted us to be, well, see, the whole time he was in the, you know, even before he was president of Fisk, he lived on the Fisk campus. Yes, sir. So yes. did many of them. And he yes, says, sir. I want you to live on this campus. Well, right? you know, from Nashville as kids, we knew, I mean, the, the John Wesley Workhouse, Arnold Bryant right. House, all them That's campus, right. a couple of streets down, even though he wasn't a member of the Fisk faculty, the Nashville legend, of course, the great Avon. Ann Avon Williams. Williams. That's right. Right, right. right around the corner on Marina Street. Yes, sir. Right. Go down Jefferson Street and then the oh. State faculty is right there. So, right. <laughs> And so this whole thing of living and being part of a community, and, yes. you know, that has been lost at first. But all of that was powerful in shaping of me. Into, and the other thing was that I had learned during the Nashville riots as a senior president of student government, what the important difference was for Fisk as a private institution compared to TSU as a state. 
Yes. Because we, I had learned as a freshman, students could participate in the movement, go put in jail, knowing that the dean or president was going to go make bail and they'd be out and back out again. They weren't going, nobody was getting put out of fist for participating in the movement. They were being supported for participating in the movement. Yes. Not, ch- not chastise or don't do this. You were expected to be about that kind of thing. You were expected to go forth into the world and comport yourself in a certain kind of way as a graduate of Fisk University, as literally one of the responsible talented 10. That's a, that's amazing because, as you said, they put those kids out of A&I. They put that's them out. Right. You say they didn't get their degrees until recently. Even while, that's while, right. And I think about, of course, you, 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 your homies, the great Joyce and Dory Ladner. That's know, right. Jackson State put them there to go to Tougaloo. That's <laughs> right. The public that's ain't right. to you. You couldn't do it. One, one half of it. Let's pause here for a second. And when we come back on the other end of the break, uh, I hope you will help us think about and think through your work. Uh, not only as an intellectual and as a, but as an activist, as a community grounded scholar, um, and how that has impacted the not only the field of Black philosophy, but the way we think about and to use the title of your second book, critical theory, critical social theory, and the interests of Black folk. Uh, so we'll, we'll be back in a moment. Uh, Greg Carr on the Black Star Network with the Black Table. We are honored to be joined today by Professor Lucius Tiaba Jr. Back in a moment. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Back at the Black Table, uh, here we are every week. We have these conversations uh, around Blackness and around social justice and, and related issues. And today we are honored to be joined by Professor Lucius Outlaw, and we are discussing his intellectual journey and his work and how he has helped us and continues to help us think about the question of what it means to be Black in the world. Prof, when many of us encountered you uh, you, of course, are no longer at Fisk. You had cycled through a few places. I know you did some business work at Dartmouth and other places, but you you had ended up taking residence at Haverford College. Mm-hmm. And um, I was, at, of course, at Temple at the time in graduate school and wrestling with this idea of Afrocentricity. Mm-hmm. And it was the only place in the world you get a PhD in Afro-American studies. So that's why we were there. Right. But, you know, I came across a conference uh, that was held in April 1987 at the University of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Your, mm-hmm. your friend Patrick Bellegarde Smith was mm-hmm. one another. They tried to define what does it mean to do black studies or what was being called Africology at the time. Right. And there were two names at Haverford that those of us who were sitting in the Afrocentric quote unquote capital in the academy, but still trying to figure out what does it mean to have a discipline called Africology? And just not black. Well, how, how do you even approach this? There was Vernon Dixon. Yes, sir. And there was Lucius T. Outlaw. And when I eventually got my hands on Africology, normative theory, I said, here it is. You started mapping out, well, I think what you call it, uh, art to tonic. You Mm -hmm. do archaeology, genealogy from Michel Foucault. You got Mm -hmm. medical science. But you're you're driven by this question. And I still use that article, by the way, Prof, in my introduction to African State class. I asked these young people a question. How do we even undertake the study of Africana? Mm-hmm. So let me let, let us let me just ask you for all of us sitting here listening to you. You know how do we organize even thinking about blackness? You spent your right. entire career thinking about it. What is blackness? Who are we? Give us some sense of how you think about the world through those. Mm-hmm. So um, another mm-hmm. seminal text for me is Peter Berg and Thomas Luxman's *The Social Construction of Reality*. So. You know, some of my graduate students who have been close to me will tell you, well, look, if you're going to go study with Newton, you got to go read Berg and Lachman first. Social construction reality. And there's a whole lot in there. But one of the fundamental things there is when we think about it, all of us come into the world and are socialized into some notion of who we are. Uh, other people give us names. We don't name ourselves. 
We are in families we don't make ourselves. We are introduced into institutions we don't choose ourselves. So there's a whole lot of making of us that goes on by way of other people, many of whom who care deeply about us, who shape us in keeping with various agendas that they have, et cetera. And we're in this complicated world in the US, white supremacy and force, et cetera, all that that's about. And we have to, wherein we are supposed to be in keeping with that project, less than fully human being, deficient being, et cetera. And then always there have been black people struggling against that to say, no, we're about a lot more than that. You're not gonna tell us who we are, or you can tell us who we are, but we was not, most of us were not lived by or identified with who you would have us be. And the black power movement was another eruption of, now we're gonna redefine ourselves in some very powerful ways. And, and, and I was deeply impacted and deeply influenced by that. Now that that means there there is there's another part of this, and that is that what it means to be is not written into our genomes. Mm -hmm. It's not coded into our genomes. Mm -hmm. What it means to be is determined by human beings ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so, in some sense, so well, what does it mean to be black? It is well, what do we who take ourselves to be black, what do we think that means? Yes. We, we, we are in some sense self-defining in that respect. Now, we're in, if you will, dialectical interaction with lots of other peoples and even among ourselves about those who are colored, Negro, Black, African, et cetera, trying to work that through. But it's a process of self-definition. And then the question is, can you give it institutional grounding? Can you give it social grounding, et cetera? One of the things that became really interesting to me was, okay, how if you take up this self-definitional project, what does that mean for the production of what you, you take to be knowledge about yourself and about those like you about the world? So the Black Studies Project became an interesting challenge for me. How do you set about creating knowledge production enterprises in keeping with an aspiration not only to be free from oppression, but also to flourish? Yes. To be creatively flourishing. And Du Bois was a tremendous inspiration in wrestling with those kinds of issues for me. Mm -hmm. But the, the intellectual challenge is a formidable one. And no question. It is a formidable one. And how, within the context of these institutions, predominantly white institutes particularly, which is where so much of the Black Studies effort initially emerged, yes. how can you fulfill this project, this aspiration, in a way by which you can also survive the critical scrutiny mm. of those who don't, many of whom don't believe what you're doing has any credibility whatsoever, right? But you're determined to do it. That, that's incredibly powerful. I mean, on so many levels, you have never, well, let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. You've always carried forward the institutions that shaped you. So mm -hmm. you've been reading how you engage with Michel Foucault and genealogy. You're not drawing from Foucault for your cultural grounding any more than Du Bois wasn't. You're drawing on Starkville. You're drawing on Fisk. You're drawing on all those collectives. You're drawing on all that. And, and then in those spaces that you have found yourself, when you raise that challenge, and you've written about this as well, the, the constant attack on Black Studies Department, mm -hmm. to find their legitimacy, you've still managed some in some way to survive, but also to thrive and then to train others without having any of that grounded in this uh, respect for the places that you find yourself found yourselves in institutionally that that displaces that grounding you've written and taught about your whole life in terms of where that greatness comes from, where that black greatness comes from. Yours was the first article, quite frankly, and of course, that's what, and you were so gracious to let me come over and hang out with you in West Philly, come out there to have friends in your house and talk through that's this. That's right. You know what I mean? Yours was the first article I read that took on 
Karinga took on mm-hmm. Asante respectfully, respectfully. agreed that it could be agreement, and at the same time said, we've still got to ground this in the lived experiences of African people. We don't have to go back to Africa, but we must include it. We shouldn't reject enslavement. We must consider it. What you raise, even a question, let me ask you this question right quick. You raise a question, you say, you know, why didn't black people just turn into perpetual terrorists and attack this country and, and attack any place we found ourselves in? That's right. You know, and, and I wonder if you talk to us a little bit about how you think of the cultural groundings and traditions mm-hmm. we have that can't be explained or understood without grounding it in the lived experiences of black people. Could you talk a little bit about? Sure. Yeah, please. So one of the things that um, my maternal grandmother used to say to me and this one, I was up in Mississippi. She said, you know, son, um, the only way you can keep somebody in a ditch is you have to get in a ditch with them. Don't get in a ditch with the white man. And I should think about, so what does this mean? Right. right. And, you know, I think about this. Right. So think of a, 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 a of an enslaved Negro woman working in the big house, preparing food for the white family. Yes. Now, she could say, well, you know, I'm going to end this terrorism over our life because I'm going to poison the whole damn family. Yes, sir. But she doesn't. Mm-hmm. She could say, you know, this white woman had a baby. This baby's going to grow up and they're going to wheel us slaves to the baby. I'm going to short circuit that. I'm going to kill their children. Yes, sir. They, so enslavement was cross-generational. So she could say, I'm going to disrupt this cross-generational enslavement because I'm going to kill the next generation. Hmm. But instead, we've got Black women, in some cases, feeding, nourishing those Black white children from the milk of our own breast. No and so I have to ask myself, now, wait a minute. What, by what reasoning did this woman decide not to poison the white family? Now, well, she was afraid. Of what? Of what? Of what? You think it was fear? Let's allow for the possibility that she thought it wasn't the right thing to do. Right? That she's making an ethical decision. Interesting. Interesting. And that she's thinking. So Interesting. she gets raped by a white male. Yes. Within a few weeks, she knows her body. She knows she's pregnant. Mm-hmm. Now she's got to worry. Do I bring this child to term? If I do, what are the other women in the slave community going to think about me? The older black women in a little bit of time, I'm going to start saying, girl, you know that dress ain't fit you like it used to. That's What's right. going on? That's right. When she starts showing, what's the white woman in the big house going to say? Huh. Why are you pregnant? Who's the daddy? And if she has a black man in the slave community, what's he going to say? Particularly when that child is born. And the skin pigmentation of that child don't look nothing like him. Mm -hmm. Now, for literally nine months, she's got to face these questions as she's carrying that child and ask herself, Mm -hmm. do I abort this child or do I bring it into this world where I can't protect it? It may be sold out from under me. It will be my child, but I can't even protect it. And yet, And yet, over and over again, these women brought children into a world and nurtured them as best they could. But day after day while pregnant, carried that child, hummed their songs, prayed to their Lord, Mm. and endured this to bring others in the world, even though they couldn't protect them. And then tried to say, but one day, child, but one day, Mm. child. And you are not to conduct yourself in the way these people did. You are to be different. And I'm saying they had to think through existential conditions and raise questions. What should 
I do. Yes. I don't need to go to France to study existentialism. No, sir. I can look at and ask the question, how did black folk wrestle with existence day in and day out and make judgments about what to do? Think of those people on the slave ships who decided not to commit suicide. Mm. What went into their thinking? What did they have to look forward to? Well, well, probably one of the beautiful things, one of the many beautiful things about your intellectual work is that you make room for both choices. That's right. I mean, because we think about the Igbo women in Montpelier who very likely poisoned James Madison's grandfather. Mm -hmm. Um, You think about Martin Delaney's Blake, where these arguments over should we run, should we stay? He's literally critiquing religion in Blake, page by page. But the beautiful thing about your concept of blackness and the way that you've worked is that you don't allow anybody expressing their existential grappling with what it means to be black to leave the circle. Just like Nikki Giovanni kissed you on the cheek. <laughs> you don't say, okay, now if you kill this cat or if you smother this baby, if you poison these people, this is part of the argument. We need, I think about Cedric Robinson who says mm-hmm. we have a higher moral standard. Michael mm-hmm. Gomez who says we didn't hold white people the same standard we held, but you don't let any of that off of this table, Prof. Mm-hmm. That is the genius, it seems to me, one of the geniuses of your concept of blackness. Can, can, let's, let's pause for a second. We want to come back and finish this final segment and continue this conversation and bring in one of your guiding spirits and fellow alum from Fisk, W.E.B. Du Bois. I'm thinking about mm-hmm. that, that talk he gave at Johnson C. Smith with the now and why, where he said, you know, they're going to change these laws and then you got to decide who you are in the world. Oh, and, really are. And then, and then gave you the baton. He said, let me get this fellow Fisk guy the baton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Africa. <laughs> anyway, when, when we come back <laughs> with Lucius the Outlaw Jr., we are going to ask him the absurdly unfair question <laughs> of whether now and why black mm. people should go, given what he has framed for us so far. Back in a moment at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Of course, this man, Black Media, he makes sure that our stories are told. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a Black man owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. So I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table. We're in our final session today with Professor Lucius T. Outlaw, Jr. Prof, when we left, uh, you had sketched out for us this ethical standard of Blackness that Black folk have lived with, grappling with the questions of oppression and enslavement in our recent memory. But I'm wondering now, as I said, as we left, you have just, uh, you've informed us, you taught your last class at Vanderbilt, and I imagine the community is grateful because that means you're going to spend that much more time with them and the family. (laughs) But you did it. Uh, on the campus, partially, that you yourself attended as a student and came back as a faculty member. And W.E.B. Du Bois, of course, you say you had your students started the Du Bois statue there at Fisk. W.E.B. Du Bois raised that question just before leaving for Ghana. Mm-hmm. Black school teachers and whether now and why, well, the social science configuration. Mm-hmm. Meeting That's yesterday. right. You know, yep. and, and so I wonder where some of your thoughts on where you think we are, mm-hmm. how you think we should be thinking and acting now. What you see in terms of social movements, because as Du Bois mm-hmm. said, once they change the laws and desegregate, then you're going to have to answer the deeper questions of race and culture. And you've spent your mm-hmm. entire career doing that. Could you help us? Where Where do you think we are today in terms of trying to answer those questions? Any of you? 
It's, um, as it has always been, it's particularly precarious. Um, and for all of the precariousness, the craziness, et cetera, um, you know, one way I put it is we got hit with two pandemics recently. One was a biological pandemic caused by a virus, COVID-19. The other was a political pandemic. Uh, and the agent was Trump that gave rise to Trumpism. Hmm. And the confluence of those two pandemics have left had lasting impact on the body politic of this country, both literally and figuratively. And of course, democracy is in question again. And there's another question of black folk will have to say democracy in the United States yet again. Right. So it is precarious. Um, but life has always been precarious for folks of African descent, African and African descent in the, on the continent and in, in the rest of the world after the encounter with folks from Europe and white supremacy, et cetera. So it's, it's precarious. Um, and now we're facing some, some serious questions. Like, you know, I was just thinking the other day, one of the things that has been deeply bothering to me is the Black Lives Matter movement, because I asked the question, which Black Lives Matter to whom, when? Mm. What I have in mind is, you know, we saw the response from a lot in this Black Studies movement when Michael Brown was killed. Yes. Now, it wasn't very long after that when a young lady from Chicago who was in a high school band that marched at the inauguration, the second inauguration of Barack Obama, she went back home to Chicago and she was killed by a blood from a, from a, from a shooting in Chicago. Yes. Now, to the best of my memory, and I may be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but there was no lifting up of the killing of that young girl as a movement around the questions of Black Lives Matter. Am I right about that? That's right. Not, not, not comparable. And to the degree that it was raised to your long term observations about blackness, it was within black communities in Chicago. Our friend Jeremiah Wright, Father Michael Fligger, and it did not spark nationwide or international outrage. You're absolutely right, Brock. And so the question becomes for me. Which black lives matter to whom and why? And it seems as though. There were those for whom the taking of a black life matters if it is done by a white police officer, but not if by someone who's black. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait a minute now. Mm. I thought these lives were to matter, should matter. That's right. Should they not matter? It is though we're literally not politically allowed to say, look, the taking of black lives by black folk is unacceptable. That's right. Well, you're giving aid and comfort to a white folk. No, no white race has ever waited for me to endorse them before they became a racist. That's they don't right. they don't wait for me to give them endorsements for this. That's right. right. So there are some deep issues here that I think we've got to wrestle with. And that if we're going to say they matter, we've got to make them matter across all registers, all aspects of our shared life together. We are we, we're almost out of time, but I want to actually ask you this in the context of your life and your work. You talked about your parents worried about what might happen at Fisk, but you also mm -hmm. written and talked about how your father wouldn't get off the sidewalk when you were mm -hmm. a little boy and the white man wanted him to move. Yeah. Where do you think this, you know, do you think that black violence against black people would have been tolerated in the community of your parents or you growing up in those all black okay. excellent institutions. So if that's the if that's if that's the truth, then when did it change and why? And how can we get back to that standard that you talked about, that ethic? I think, you know, I would say crucial insights into this are to be had by reading uh, two books. One is called The Declining Significance of Race. The other is The Truly Disadvantaged. Mm. The great William Julius Wilson. Right. Yes. And one of the things that William Julius Wilson explores is, and this is pertinent to the Du Bois with or not, when, when Wilson says, okay, you got so desegregation, you got the movement of jobs out of the Northeast and the Midwest to the South and to the West, et cetera. 
And with desegregation, you get the relocation of the black middle class away from those neighborhoods, like rather than living on the campus of Fisk and around Fisk, I live in Green Hills, right? Yes. Now, one of the things Wilson explores is what does it mean when you don't have day in and day out those exa- living examples of certain kinds of achievement, comportment, et cetera, that you grow up around when all black people are living together? Like in my neighborhood, there was a group of boys on one side of town that started, they were going to start up a, a gang called a Red Hat Gang. <laughs> my father and some other black men got together and had a conversation. Black men from my side of town and the other side of town where these boys gathered. These black men got together, had a conversation, and then said to those young men from the other side of town, there ain't going to be but one gang, and we're that gang. <laughs> we ain't having no gang. Now, and these are young boys. They would go to St. Louis in the summer, Chicago in the summer. They had a taste of the gang culture. They're going to come back to Starbucks. They're going to form them a gang in Starbucks. These black men got together, met and discussed it, and then went and started telling these boys and their father, wow. and included, there ain't going to be but one gang, and we that gang. Y'all ain't starting no gang here, period. There's the answer, Pro. You've, you, you've given us the answer. I mean, it's not the academic study in the problem. It's not the policymakers trying to. It is literally going to come from those same community formations you grew up in and have written and taught about your whole life. Now, how, how, can, how can we repair? We must have. We have to be able to repair it. Right? I mean, we what, can. The precarity of black life that you talked about. How do we, we approach it? Well, again, you know, if you read what Du Bois says and whether or not, now look at what he says. We must have black schools black colleges, black literary tradition, black this, black this. And one of the fundamentals he says is we must have families through which we inculcate children in certain kinds of ways. Now, that's challenging for me because two of my three sons are married to young white women. And those are my four grandchildren. Yes. So now I now have to help them understand, as I said to one of my students who took the Du Bois seminar, which was a profound experience for him, you ain't responsible for enslavement and white supremacy, but you are responsible for what you do. You now have the responsibility and the opportunity to redefine what whiteness means, to mm-hmm. rehabilitate whiteness. Mm. After that, right. we can't, we won't get, whiteness has to be remade, reconstructed. It has to be remade. It has to be, something has to happen to it. And right. we can't and do that. Right. <laughs> and so I say to people, one uh-huh. of my essays is a rehabilitation of whiteness. And so I say, if black folk can take the notion of blackness and turn it from a negative to a positive, which is what we have done, white folk can rehabilitate what whiteness means. We don't have to eliminate whiteness. I have no desire to eliminate white people from the world, but this whole thing about replacement, silly argument, that's not my goal at all. Mm -hmm. What I do want what I have tried to do in my teaching, working in predominantly white institutions is to say, it is not in my best interest for white folk to have institutions of higher education only to themselves and to socialize another generation of white folk without inter- intervention from black folk and other non-white people. That is not in my best interest. It's too dangerous. Mm. It's in my interest to help young white folk come to a critical understanding of what whiteness has meant and to have the courage and the creativity to redefine what whiteness can be going forward. Man, that's, you know what, Whew. as the young people say, you just drop some jewels, brother. That's a fact right there. I mean, in, in, in fact, let us take well, in about 60 seconds or you know, a minute if we, can, if we can do it in a minute. You now stepping out of that day-to-day valence that you've been in now for, was it 52 years, you said? 52 years. As a, as a college professor. And man, now we know for all your brilliance, coming out of the family and community you came out of, like so many uh, black men and women, you can't spell retire. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's not one of the words. So I'm just wondering, <laughs> we all want to know what's next in terms of your work. We know you're somewhere working on something like a musician, you never stop playing. So what you working on, Prof, as you now so, that? Over the next six months, I'm gonna work on a project that is, you know, and I just wrote to someone the other day and said, nope, I can't do that essay for that special issue of the journal. I'm going to turn my attention to doing something I've been incubating for a couple of decades, and it's to work on one essay by Ralph Ellison. 
one essay by Ellison called A Little Man at Chiha Station. That's all Stop. I want to say. Hey, about hey, that. hey, we can't bring back the split. Brother, that little man at Chiha Station, that Tuskegee article. That's look, y'all, I can't tell <laughs> Look, everybody, everybody, everybody when is Kendrick going to drop the next? No, 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 no. This one that's, right here. That's what I'm going to work on. This and is what other, you What? And, go ahead, go ahead, bro, please. Oh. And the other thing is, as of July 1st, I will be an active member of the Haverford Corporation. The corporation is a legal entity that owns Haverford College and is responsible for overseeing the college. They delegate the oversight to the board of managers who delegates management to the, to the president and his staff. But the corporation continues to oversee asking the question, is the college maintaining its commitment to Guayco values and principles? I've now been voted on to the corporation and I will be doing that for the next three or four years. I'm really without words because if memory serves me correctly, you did a turn on Fisk's trustee board. Didn't you? No, I was never on the board. Oh, I thought I was, you were on the board. I don't know no, how they did it, you not to be went, the president of Fisk. That's a whole nother. We had to bring you back. <laughs> you, you, you know what happened when Du Bois came and was asked to give a talk and he talked about when, when uh, the last white president was still there and he told it was time to go in the 1930s. The attorney and, Salenti, no question. <laughs> Long and, they said, <laughs> and they said, we don't want him back here no more. That's right. That's right. That's right. So I weighed in when Hazel Lear was president and said, this is all wrongheaded. Y'all should be doing this. And so I've literally been persona non grata in certain Lord in have mercy. But that's OK. You know what? That is OK, Prof. I, I mean, you know, you have labored not only for our people, but for humanity for so long and continue to do it. This is wonderful news to hear about Haverford and this little man at Chira Station. I'm sure my brother and another one of your many apprentices, Larry Jackson, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be very happy to hear mm -hmm. that you've taken on that that essay from Shadow and Act. Because uh, in so many ways, you are the product of that little man. Oh, it's a powerful essay. It's an ex it is one of the finest essays I've ever read, read in my life. Oh, you're going to make me go somewhere and, and sit with that for a couple hours this afternoon. Listen, you all, if you have not, uh, if you're not familiar with Lucius Outlaw, you need to get his book on race and philosophy, uh, critical social theory and in the interests of black folk. Uh, check him out. He's all over social media now because of YouTube and everywhere you can see his lectures. But uh, we want to thank you, Prof, for spending some time with us. And please, you have an open invitation. We want you back to have more conversation here uh -huh. Well, let's be be alert. There's something coming out in in uh, November that's going to be might be of interest to you. You know, Jeffrey Stewart did this. Oh, of course, book did this book on Elaine Locke. On Elaine Locke, no question. You know what? I call it a deeply troubled book. Woo! You gonna do the review? <laughs> well, I've done an essay. It's not a review because halfway through the book, I refuse to read it any further. My God. And so then the editor of the journal said, well, can you write an essay about why you won? I said, yes, I can. That essay is coming out in Boundary 2 in November. Well, Boundary 2, of course, Ronald Judy and those cats up there in Pittsburgh. Oh, man. You know yes. what? <laughs> hey, y'all, the Black Table, look, we're building this prof this week by week. This is the type of engagement that I suspect we, what we want to model this on in part is the kind of engagement that you all really developed in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And an essay like this, you all, you know, Jeffrey Stewart, we had him at Howard. He came, of course, he did a lot of research there. One of the national That's right. that he had just been announced when we had him come and do the talk. And so, uh, but, but nobody, look, the cipher is real. Nobody comes with universal phrase. They got to, we got to get a guy in the black community, whether it be the basketball court, the, the spades game <laughs> or the book. <laughs> we got to have a conversation. Cannot wait to read that, bro. Thank you. And it's going to be in Boundary 2, the journal Boundary 2, you all, the number two. I, I can share it with you before it even comes out if you wish. Man, I would love that. And I know the rest of y'all like, wait a minute. No, y'all just going to have to wait. Have to wait. <laughs> As the young people say, say less. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> Listen, man, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Prof. Thank you for having me. I've been honored by Greg and you have been uh, admired by me, respected by me. 
for bringing me into your trust and respect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Papa, no, that, 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 that's my honor. It's the least we can do. You, you received a baton, so we're going to keep running with you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Love you, brother. Talk to you soon. Talk to you. All right. All right. Uh, we will now uh, come back in a moment and we'll clear the table and prepare for next week the Black Table. Back in a moment. We welcome you to the launch of the Mass Poor People's Low Wage Assembly and Moral March on Washington, D.C., June 18, 2022. We are a new, a set of reports, and we are powerful. to demonstrate the compelling power that we, poor and low-income people, have to reconstruct society from the bottom up. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. Because we know that there is no scarcity in this land. The only scarcity is the moral will to do what's right. We are those with sub-minimum wage jobs who can't afford sky-high rent. People with disabilities are the fastest growing minority group. It's crazy to me that in 2021, it's still legal for workplaces to pay a sub-minimum wage to people with disabilities. There are still so much trial and tribulations that we go through as Indigenous people. We can't get a decent wage to sustain ourselves, nor can we get adequate housing. Veterans across this nation say enough is enough. We can't pat essential workers on the back on one day and then cut their health care the next day. Health is a political choice. What more do I need to do to prove that my voice is just as valuable as anyone else's? There are still forces in denial that would try to slow walk our transition to a clean economy and a just future for us all. We have an immoral system run by immoral people. But together we walk, and we walk and we fight. It's time for a change. Reconstruyamos esta gran nación. See, we are people of resilience as we fight these interlocking injustices together. When we work together, mobilize together, and rise together, we become a voice for the voiceless, and we become an agent of change in a time where great change is needed. We need the third reconstruction to ensure that deaf people, people with disabilities, and all people can have the right to live and to thrive. We know what they are doing, but the question is, what are we going to do? Reconstruction begins when we change our mentality and say it's time for you to get your foot off of my neck. Welcome back to the Black Table here at the Black Star Network. I'm Greg Carr, honored to be your host. And today we have had a very powerful conversation with uh, one of the greatest minds we have, the great Lucius T. Outlaw Jr. In his essay, Africology, Normative Theory, published in the book On Race and Philosophy, Dr. Outlaw writes this about the nature of us thinking about blackness. He says, it is a matter of perspective, the frame through which we structure and go about our work. The consequences, of course, are enormous. At the stake is the, is the safety of negotiating the mind field of life on the way to a chosen destination. Norms to, governing, to govern theorizing about norms for social life are themselves part of social life and are likewise conditioned by the choices of destination and route. No amount of theorizing can eliminate the risks involved in choosing either in social life 
or in theorizing. Thus, we must not be pretentious about what is to come from an attempted refinement of black studies into a more mature and socially responsible discipline of Africology. We've spent an hour with a man who has made some powerful choices over the course of his life to date, and we are all the better for them. Thank you, Professor Alvaro. And join us next week, same time at the Black Tape. Thank you.